The Subcommittee on Health uh, will now come to order. Uh, good morning, colleagues. Our country is in pain. Americans are afraid, they're sick, they're hungry, and jobless. And over 80,000 souls have been lost. And the government that was supposed to protect them has failed. We have the most cases and the most deaths from COVID-19 of any nation in the world. Why? First is the inept, ineffective, and extremely late effort to respond to what was clear to many scientists and public health experts in January. That basic delay cost precious lives and is continuing to cost lives. Mothers losing daughters, daughters losing fathers because of incompetence denial, delay, and a disorganized response. Frankly, I'm tired of those who bear the responsibility accepting none of it while defect, uh, deflecting blame on others. The previous administration, the World Health Organization, the Wuhan lab, anywhere but where the blame belongs. Today, we're gonna to hear about the disastrous federal response to an approaching pandemic. Dr. Bright has filed one of the most specific and troubling whistleblower complaints I've ever seen. He was the right person with the right judgment at the right time. He was not only ignored, he was fired for being right. We can't have a system where the government fires those who get it right and reward those who get it completely wrong. I now uh, ask for a moment of silence in honor of the over 80,000 Americans who have lost their lives from COVID-19.
Is this witness testifying as a government witness or as an individual? Uh, the um, Dr. Bright is uh, is testifying as a federal employee, correct? Mm -hmm. And representing, he is a federal employee representing himself. I also would like to um, uh, inform the members that uh, uh, Dr. Bright's attorney, Deborah Katz, is at the table. She's requested a, uh, a microphone. Uh, she is not here as a witness, uh, so we will not be asking her questions. She is simply here to um, uh, representing her, uh, her client. Every whistleblower deserves to be heard. Dr. Bright has raised serious allegations, and they deserve investigation. Whistleblowers must have their rights protected and deserve to have their allegations investigated with policies and procedures that have been long established and upheld as independent and fair. Madam Chair, on April 23rd, CNN reported that you plan to call Dr. Bright to testify. Dr. Bright did not actually file his whistleblower complaint with the Office of Special Counsel until Tuesday, May 5th. That same day, it was announced on social media that you planned to hold a hearing, but it was not officially noticed until two days later. By Friday, May 8th, the Office of Special Counsel recommended that Dr. Bright be temporarily reinstated as director of BARDA so that it could thoroughly conduct its investigation and move forward with its usual processes of reviewing a whistleblower complaint. Despite the hearing memo, no final determination of a violation of a whistleblower statute actually has been made. Following a robust investigation process, the customary setting for a whistleblower hearing would be in our Energy and Commerce Committee under, the, under oath in the Office, uh, Oversight and Investigation Subcommittee. To say this hearing is premature and it is a disservice to the investigations of Dr. Bright's complaint, I think goes without saying. You trampled on minority rights. You would have never tolerated that when you were in the minority. You neglected the tradition of this committee and in the manner this hearing was called. President Trump and his administration have failed to provide the consistent and stable leadership that is necessary to guide our nation through this public health and economic crisis. For months, the president has delivered mixed messages and misinformation to the American people, creating confusion across the nation. Instead of showing leadership, competence, and vision in a time of crisis, the administration has abdicated its responsibility and forced states to fend for themselves and find their own way out of this pandemic. And while states and frontline healthcare workers were pleading for personal protective equipment, testing supplies, and other resources to protect them and their patients, President Trump's response was to let states fight it out on the open market. For months, the president has refused to develop and implement a national testing program. For months, we've been promised millions of tests were right around the corner. The promises have been hollow. Testing is getting better, but nowhere near what it needs to be. It doesn't help that the president proclaimed about testing earlier this week, and I quote, we have met the moment and we have prevailed. That could not be further from the truth, Mr. President. Dr. Rick Bright, the former director of BARDA, has come forward as a whistleblower and made serious allegations, including a lack of urgency by administration officials to respond to the virus, mismanagement, and failure to procure necessary supplies in disregard for public health and scientific integrity. He claimed his claims lie at the heart of this committee's concerns regarding the administration's response to the COVID-19 pandemic. We're here today to hear the perspective of Dr. Bright, who was positioned to discuss discuss the administration's preparations and response to this pandemic. Now, the failures we've seen simply cannot persist. That's why the Energy and Commerce Committee continues to conduct robust oversight and to propose bold legislative solutions. We've been demanding answers and information from the administration on testing, contact tracing, the supply chain, food safety, and the safety of food production workers, and attempts to undermine science and public health. To date, we have yet to receive any sufficient responses from the Trump administration. So I just want to thank Dr. Bright for coming forward and for 
for being here today. I want to thank you, Madam Chair, for bringing him here. And I'm hopeful that this hearing will help us better understand the failures of the Trump administration so that collectively we can find solutions that will help us finally get a handle on this virus. We're not in O&I, but it is extraordinarily unusual to have a government witness as an individual with private counsel at the witness table and with a microphone. And so I'm just trying to get clarification for future uh, precedent setting for the committee, and that's the only reason I'm asking this. He obviously had counsel. Um, if we should follow the protocol that is prescribed for the Oversight and Investigations Committee in similar circumstances. I'm thankful that President Trump invoked the Defense Production Act to ramp up U.S. manufacturing of masks and ventilators. And the President's used the emergency powers and money Congress has provided to launch unprecedented efforts to search the globe for supplies, to rapidly advance development of treatments and vaccines. But we still have much bipartisan work to do to respond and adapt to the challenges presented by COVID-19 and the lessons we're learning. Um, and so I thank you for being here. I've enjoyed working with you over the years um, and uh, continue to uh, look forward to working with you and others to get this right. And Madam Chair, um, we have a, a letter for you uh, asking for a Rule 11 hearing that we'll provide to you. And with that, I yield back. I would now like to introduce our witness, uh, the first panel today. Uh, Dr. Rick Bright is a highly regarded scientist with expertise in the fields of immunology, therapeutics, uh, vaccine, and diagnostic development. For the last decade, he's been a career civil servant at the Department of Health and Human Services. In 2016, Dr. Bright was appointed Director of BARDA, the third Director of BARDA, uh, the Biomedical Advanced uh, Research and Development Authority. As Director of BARDA, he has testified before Congress as a government expert numerous times, including before this subcommittee. Good morning to you. Good morning, Chairwoman Eshoo and Ranking Member Burgess and distinguished members of the subcommittee. I am Dr. Rick Bright, a career public servant and a scientist who has spent 25 years of my career focused on addressing pandemic outbreaks. Today, the world is confronting a public health emergency unlike any we've seen in over a century. We are facing a highly transmissible and deadly virus which not only claims lives but also disrupts the very foundations of our society. The American healthcare system is being taxed to the limit our economy is spiraling downward, and our population is being paralyzed by fear, stemming from a lack of a coordinated response and a dearth of accurate, clear communication about the path forward. Americans yearn to get back to work, to open their businesses, and to provide for their families. I get that. However, what we do must be done carefully and with guidance from the best scientific minds. Our window of opportunity is closing. If we fail to improve our response now based on science, I fear the pandemic will get worse and be prolonged. There will be likely a resurgence of COVID-19 this fall. It'll be greatly compounded by the challenges of seasonal influenza. Without better planning, 2020 could be the darkest winter in modern history. First and foremost, we need to be truthful with the American people. Americans deserve the truth. The truth must be based on science. We have the world's greatest scientist. Let us lead. Let us speak without fear of retribution. We must listen. Each of us can and must do our part now. On Tuesday, Dr. Fauci delivered a message in a voice that is clear and trustworthy as he encouraged us to act with caution as we return to our daily lives. We should listen to him and other scientists sharing their expertise. While waiting for a cure and a vaccine, which I believe will come, there are things we must do immediately. We must increase the public education about the basics, washing hands, social distancing, appropriate face covering. They're simple but critical steps to buy valuable time until there's vaccine. We need to ramp up production of essential equipment and supplies, including raw materials and critical components. Shortages of these increase the risk of our frontline healthcare workers, and they deserve the best equipment to protect themselves. We need to facilitate equitable distribution of essential equipment and supplies, 
And finally, we need a national testing strategy. The virus is here. It's everywhere. We need to be able to find it, isolate it, and stop it. We need to have the right testing for everyone who needs it. We need to be able to trace contacts, isolate, quarantine, and appropriately while striving to develop a cure. Initially, our nation was not as prepared as we should have been, as we could have been. Some scientists raised early warning signals that were overlooked, and pages from our pandemic playbook were ignored by some in leadership. There will be plenty of time to look back to assess what has happened so we can improve. But right now, we need to focus on getting things right going forward. We need a comprehensive plan that everyone knows and everyone participates in. Congress has taken important steps to support the response, and there's much more we can do. With your help, we can get through this crisis. Working cooperatively, cooperatively with our global partners, we can and will succeed in finding a cure for COVID-19. But that success depends on what we do today. We will either be remembered for what we did or for what we failed to do to address this crisis. I call on all of us to act, to ensure the health, safety, and prosperity of all Americans. You can count on me to do my part. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Bright. Uh, we'll now move to member questions, and I recognize myself for five minutes. What do you mean when you say 2020 will be uh, the darkest winter in modern history? Chairwoman Eshoo, thank you for your question. The window is closing to address this pandemic because we still do not have a standard, centralized, coordinated plan to take our nation through this response. I believe with proper leadership and collaboration across government, with the best science leading the way, we can devise a comprehensive strategy. We can devise a plan that includes all of Americans and help them, help us, guide us through this pandemic. But time is running out because the virus is still spreading everywhere. People are getting restless to leave their homes, and we have to make critical decisions on how to balance the economy and science. My concern about this fall is compounded by my knowledge and preparation and response to many years of influenza outbreaks, mm -hmm. pandemic influenza outbreaks and seasonal influenza outbreaks. In our country in 2017, we had nearly 79,000 people die in the U.S. from influenza. That coupled with a COVID-19 resurgence this fall could be devastating for our healthcare systems and for Americans. We have a limited window of opportunity to get plans in place to address both of those. Thank you. Uh, when you look at the first four months of this year, would you describe the uh, government's uh, and the administration's response as a success or a failure? I believe we could have done better. I believe there are critical steps mm -hmm. that we did not take in time. Was there a failure to respond when you correctly pushed to claim uh, early virus samples from uh, or to obtain early virus samples from China so we could develop critical medical countermeasures? From my perspective in working with companies to develop drugs and vaccines and diagnostic, viral samples are critical. As soon as we were aware that this virus could pose a, a significant threat to human lives, I began pushing for those virus samples, and I met frustration and dismissal. And when did you do that? I did that in the office of the Secretary of Azar, in January, the push for the virus samples initially mentioned on January 23rd, and a strong push on January 27th for those virus samples. And was there a failure to respond with the needed urgency when you correctly pushed to ramp up production of masks, uh, respirators, uh, syringes, swabs? Congresswoman, we've known for quite some time that our stockpile is insufficient in having those critical personal protective equipment so once this virus began spreading and became known to be a threat, 
I did feel quite concerned that we didn't have those supplies. I began pushing urgently in January, along with some industry colleagues as well. And those urges, those alarms were not responded to with action. Was there a failure to take immediate action when you correctly pushed to acquire additional doses of the drug uh, remdesivir, uh, which, which is the only drug so far that has uh, appears to be uh, at least mildly uh, effective, thank God, uh, for uh, treating people with COVID-19? There was no action taken on the urgency to uh, come up with a plan for acquisition of limited doses of remdesivir, nor to distribute those rem limited doses of remdesivir once we had the scientific data to support their use for people infected with this virus. And instead of acting on your recommendations, was the response of uh, others to try and cut you out of key meetings, marginalize your participation? I was told that my urgings, urgings uh, were causing a commotion and I was removed from those meetings. Uh, my time has expired. Uh, I now recognize the gentleman, uh, the ranking member of the subcommittee, Dr. Burgess. Let me ask you a question about uh, hydrochloroquine, really even maybe a little bit more broadly, uh, the disease-modifying anti-rheumatic drugs that have been looked at for therapy for this disease. Um, I ask about hydroxychloroquine because it does seem to be central to whatever disagreement you had with the Department of HHS and, and the administration, but hydroxychloroquine was initially identified as a potential therapeutic because, number one, of its anti-inflammatory effects and its ability to calm things in the immune system. And as we know, one of the features of this disease is the overwhelming cytokine response that uh, it overwhelms the, the host. Uh, there also may be an effect of blocking the virus uh, at, the, uh, at the point of contact with the cell. Certainly something that probably deserves a little investigation. But again, it's not the only one. There were some other drugs. Uh, and I think, if I'm correct, BARDA supported with investments. Acterma and Kivzara, which are thought to have similar impacts on the uh, ability to suppress the, the cytokine response of hydrochloroquine. Is, am I correct in that? There are a number of drugs that we were evaluating initially, Congressman, that um, we were considering for, to conduct clinical studies to get further information if they really had an impact and if they were safe to use in patients infected with this virus. Do you have available to you the dollar amounts that BARDA uh, appropriated or authorized for each of those two drugs, Secterma and Kifsara? I don't have those numbers available with me now. Would, would you be able to make them available to the committee? I believe um, HHS could make those available. BARDA could probably make those investments available. Were you concerned with hydroxychloroquine at the time you made those awards for Acterma and Kifsara? Was the concern with hydroxychloroquine, which became then paramount in your disagreement with the administration, was it already established when you made these other investments in similar medications? The, um, my concerns uh, around the safety of hydroxychloroquine in people infected with the COVID-19 virus were reflective of the scientific review that we received from an interagency group of clinicians and regulatory experts and scientists. At the time that we learned about uh, hydroxychloroquine and chloroquine, there was limited data available and our proposal and, and actions were to see if we could identify a source of that drug so the NIH could conduct a randomized controlled clinical study. That's a similar action we took with um, remdesivir. Once we thought remdesivir had promise from data coming from China, NIH quickly established a clinical study, a randomized controlled study to evaluate remdesivir. So with hydroxychloroquine, that was also our preferred plan of action. And you, of course, authored the letter to the FDA asking for the emergency use authorization for hydroxychloroquine. I was directed as a BARDA director from the office of the HHS secretary to put in place an expanded access IND program to make chloroquine donation from Bayer available 
to Americans through a unique opportunity um, that would utilize an app and perhaps would make it available to Americans who were not under close supervision of a health care provider. Uh, During that, I did, of course, this hearing, not really a hearing on hydroxychloroquine, I, of course, would welcome a, a, a robust hearing on, on therapeutics and the research that's going on, what we've invested in, what seems to be panning out, which has, what has not. I'll note that both Givzara and, uh, and the other medication may not have panned out. And I think the manufacturing company for Kizara announced that they'll discontinue part of the clinical study because it looked unlikely to help COVID patients. But I will tell you, since starting this, since you identified yourself and this hearing got noticed, I'm hearing from a lot of doctors, um, my state, around the country, who have experience using hydroxychloroquine and chloroquine, uh, coupled with uh, erythromycin and zinc, and they're reporting significant benefit if it is used early enough in the course and may eliminate the need for hospitalization and ventilatory the support. Gentleman's time I don't is know expired. if that's right, the but I think it's important enough that we should look into it and would just be interested if you did that as part of your duties at BARDA. The gentleman's time has expired. Uh, the is, chair the now recognizes... The um, would the witness be able to answer the question? Question. Mm -hmm. So I believe it's important. I've heard those anecdotal stories as well, um, and they were not conducted in the context of a, a randomized controlled clinical study. It's very difficult to understand data from those types of observational studies or anecdotal stories. So the drug might have some benefit in some populations, but we won't know that until we have that information from a truly randomized controlled clinical study. Many of those studies are ongoing now. Some of those studies we're starting to see data from, and those studies in those populations tested haven't shown an overwhelming evidence of benefit from the use of hydroxychloroquine in those patients. But the different studies are devised to look at different angles of it, as you described. Yeah, most of those studies are at the end when someone is already critical. time has expired. You can't do those uh, studies the without the drug, though. And you the, did need to uh, acquire the drug. Ranking, this, to, uh, to uh, the gentleman's the time, please. Let's let's. We all want to be fair uh, to each other. The gentleman's time has expired. Uh, the chair recognizes uh, the chairman of the full committee, Mr. Pallone, for his five minutes of questions. Thank you, Madam Chair. And let me just say, uh, Dr. Bright, thank you for your courage in being here. When I was uh, younger, we used to read a book by President Kennedy called Profiles and Courage. And, you know, your courage in being here reminds me of some of the people I read about in that book. Uh, I am concerned, um, Dr. Bright, that the Trump administration does not have plans for a nationwide vaccine program to ensure that once a vaccine is approved, we'll be able to quickly make it available to everyone. In other words, I don't want to see the same mistakes by the Trump administration, the incompetence that they had with the supply chain and the testing repeated with the vaccine. And you stated at the outset of the pandemic in January, you began urgently pressing HHS officials to provide the necessary resources to begin vaccine development that, that your pleas fell on deaf ears. And as the pandemic progressed, you also stated you were alarmed by the pressures coming from some administration officials for your agency to invest in drugs and vaccines, I quote, without proper scientific vetting or that lacked scientific merit. Uh, can you tell us where we are now in the hunt for a vaccine and where we could have been had the HHS leaders made investment decisions sooner than that were based on scientific merit? Thank you, Congressman. As we all know, vaccines are very difficult to make. It's, it's mm -hmm. nothing that you can do quickly, and you need multiple shots on goal to try to make a vaccine. There are many diseases we've attempted to make vaccines for through history, and we still haven't been able to do so. So it takes many opportunities and many different approaches. Right now, there are over 100 different approaches for developing a vaccine for this coronavirus. So we're confident that, um, hopefully, I should say, at least one of those or two of those will work, but you've identified key critical challenges that we need to anticipate and prepare for early. Number one is the, the supply chain. 
for those vaccines, needed reagents and buffers and salts and various ingredients that go into a vaccine, as well as the glass vials that the vaccines are put into, and needles and syringes, and then a carefully coordinated distribution and administration strategy. We haven't yet gotten to those downstream strategies yet in our government, and I think those are going to become a significant issue down the road if we don't plan for that now. And I guess my concern is, you know, I'm very critical of administration in terms of their, I call it incompetence with the supply chain, with lack of testing. Uh, I'm afraid the same thing is going to happen with vaccines and once it's, and the distribution. I mean, should I be concerned based on your experience? Absolutely, sir. I'm, we're already seeing those challenges with limited doses of remdesivir with data that we're getting that remdesivir has some benefit in people. And we have limited doses and we haven't scaled up production and we don't have a plan on how to fairly and equitably distribute that drug. If you can imagine the scenario this fall or winter, or maybe even early next spring when vaccine becomes available, there's no one company that can produce enough for our country or for the world. It's going to be limited supplies. We need to have a strategy and plan in place now to make sure that we can not only fill that vaccine, make it, distribute it, but administer it in a fair and equitable plan. And that's not the case at this we point. We don't have that yet, and it is a significant concern. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. The gentleman yields back. Uh, I now have the pleasure of recognizing the ranking member of the full committee, uh, Mr. Walden. Yes. On, the, on the first case of SARS-CoV-2 in the U.S., it was identified, I believe, in January 22nd in Washington State. CDC put the uh, positive specimen in culture that day, correct? I believe so. I think it's January 20th. Okay. It's my understanding uh, the samples from the virus were made available to the U.S. government and that the CDC expanded the virus stocks between January 29th and February 3rd and shared the BEI uh, on February 4th to enable broad sharing. Now, according to your complaint, after virus samples were available to the U.S. government from the Washington State case, and potentially even after the CDC's effort to grow the virus and then share with the BEI biorepository, you were still seeking uh, to obtain uh, a sample of the virus, correct? That's true, sir, but we need more than one virus. Right, I'm, I'm going to get to that. Why were the strains not available within the U.S. government uh, not available to you? Were they, were they available to you? So I was asking for viruses in January because we wanted to make sure that we had a head start on developing no. the vaccine. Uh, yeah, no, I and get that. And they I, became available in February, I believe it was February 6th, um, through the BEI resources. Right. Then uh, those were distributed to laboratories. Did, did you ask for the virus sample from, from Washington State that absolutely. was part of that? You did? I and okay. Varda did. We asked okay. to make sure we had access to those viruses and they were distributed to the right laboratories and the right and, companies. And where did you ultimately get the virus that you distributed sample? Some where of those viruses come? came from the BEI resources uh, at, at NIH, and some of those viruses came from laboratories that received the initial seed from CDC. Okay, that's helpful to know. Um, in, in some conversations uh, I've been a part of with some at, at, at NIH, they indicated that the real key here was to get the, the DNA sequence, uh, which uh, China did eventually put up, I believe, at the end of December, early January. And that in terms of going after the vaccine, it was that sequencing that really mattered most to get started on, on vaccine development. And, and there are other scientists who are very distinguished who believe that the delay in getting the virus sample actually didn't set them back. Is that an accurate assessment, or do you have a disagreement in, in that view? And I know scientists disagree, so do we up here. But I'm kind of hearing that, that having the sequencing really mattered most and getting the virus important but did not set them back in proceeding to get the vaccine and vaccine development underway. And so the, the China posted the first sequence on January 11th, I believe, or made it available January 10th or January 11th. It's important to understand that the sequence is available. When a, se a sequence is available, you, some companies with some technologies can get started with that sequence information. And you still they? are vulnerable because you have another country um, in their laboratories that posts it on, on the internet or a database of their sequence. So there could still be challenges, especially it, for national security about the my, integrity of that sequence. Yeah, it's before incredible. my time runs out, oh, it's run out. I was just gonna ask, did they begin efforts at that time once they got the sequence? 
The NIH began efforts on a synthetic messenger RNA vaccine candidate. However, without the viruses, you really cannot tell if the neutralizing antibodies right. listed by that or your diagnostics or your therapeutics can actually work. You can try to synthesize a virus with a sequence, but it's never going to be representative of the actual virus. And we're spending billions of dollars on drugs, vaccines, and diagnostics. We want to have the most credible information sure. possible. Right. Thank you, Madam Chair. The, uh, the gentleman uh, yields back. Uh, pleasure to recognize the gentleman from New York, Mr. Engel, for his five minutes of questions. Thank you, Madam. Thank you, Madam Chair, uh, for holding today's hearing. Uh, doctor, if you were a betting man, um, oh, sorry. Thank you. Um, Doctor, if you were a betting man, uh, when would you bet that we would uh, time and that we would have a vaccine? That's a very difficult question to answer. I know that there are companies in, in academic labs working very hard. Um, it, normally it takes up to 10 years to make a vaccine. We've, we've done it faster in emergency situations. But from uh, when we had starting material in the freezer for Ebola, it, but for a novel virus, it's, it's actually haven't been done yet that quickly. So a lot of optimism is swirling around a, a 12 to 18 month time frame. If everything goes perfectly, we've never seen everything go perfectly. My concern is if we rush too quickly and consider cutting out critical steps, we may not have a full assessment of the safety of that vaccine, so it's still going to take some time. I still think 12 to 18 months is an aggressive schedule, and I think it's going to take longer than that to do so. 12 to 18 months from now, or 12 to 18 months from when this all started at the beginning of the year? It would be 12 to 18 months from when the particular manufacturers first received the material or information that they needed to start developing that vaccine. It's critical to note when we say 12 to 18 months, that doesn't mean for an FDA-approved vaccine. That means to have sufficient data and information on the safety and immunogenicity, if not efficacy, to be able to use on an emergency basis. And that is the consideration that we, are, we have in mind when we talk about an accelerated timeline. Um, the administration has um, failed at every turn. The president has uh, sidelined our best scientists pushed baseless conspiracy theories, and more recently prescribed unproven remedies like Lysol to suffering Americans. Since the early days of the outbreak, the President encouraged doctors to prescribe chloroquine to suffering Americans despite a lack of evidence supporting its use. On April 24th, the President's hand-picked FDA commissioner even came out against the use of chloroquine for COVID-19 cases. Doctor, what are the dangers of chloroquine if prescribed incorrectly? And what happened when you raised the issue of chloroquine use in coronavirus patients with HHS leadership? Congressman, our concern centered around the, the potential use of chloroquine in people who were infected with this coronavirus. There are data of uh, the effective use and safe use of chloroquine in malaria patients and other patients and other indications. We also knew that there were potential safety risks with chloroquine to cause irregular heart, irregular heart rhythms and even in some cases death. So our concern was with limited information and knowledge, especially of its use in COVID-19 infected patients and the potential for those risks. Then we should uh, make sure that any studies with that drug were done in a carefully controlled clinical study under close watchful eye of a physician so they could respond to a patient if they did experience one of those adverse events. There wasn't sufficient data at that time to support use of this drug in patients with COVID-19 without close physician supervision. And when you raise that issue of uh, chloroquine use in coronavirus patients with HHS leadership, uh, what happened to you? You were re removed as a director of BARDA. Is that, is that not true? I, I believe part of the removal process for me was, is, is initiated because of a push 
back that I gave when they asked me to put in place an expanded access protocol that would make chloroquine more freely available to Americans that were not under the close supervision of a physician and may not even be confirmed to be infected with the coronavirus. The scientists at FDA, BARDA, and NIH, and CDC worked hard to switch that to an emergency use authorization with strict guardrails that the patients would be in a hospital confirmed to be infected with this virus under close supervision of a doctor and who could not otherwise participate in a randomized controlled study. My concerns were alleviated somewhat by being able to lock that in the stockpile with those conditions. However, my concerns were escalated when I learned that leadership in the Department of Health and Human Services were pushing to make that drug available outside of this emergency use authorization to flood New York and New Jersey with this drug, regardless of the EUA. And when I spoke outside of our government and shared my concerns for the American public, that, I believe, was a straw that broke the camel's back and escalated my removal. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Gentlemen's time has expired. A uh, pleasure to recognize the gentleman from Kentucky, Mr. Guthrie, for his five minutes of questions. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Bright, for being here. We appreciate it very much. Uh, reading through, through your, uh, your complaint, I just kind of want to point out, I think the chairman said earlier, talked about the lack of urgency and implies the president's lack of urgency. I think most of my constituents want to know that things are getting done and where is the president on, on this? And, and you're having issues with the leadership at Health and Human Services and you're giving them recommendations. So if they're not accepting your recommendation to them, I, I would, I think, fairly surmise they're not passing that on to the White House. So the president's probably unaware of what you're, you're putting forth because it says, in reading from your complaint on page 23, fortunately, White House Trade Advisor Peter Navarro shared Dr. Bright's sense of urgency. So that's in your sense of urgency. So talking about the urgency in the White House, so you have a meeting with him on Saturday. He calls you back in on Sunday. We have you prepare your recommendations and a memo for Mick Mulvaney, chief of staff, so essentially the president. And then, so you meet with, you get around the leadership of HHS, meet essentially with the president, since with Mick Mulvaney, and, and, and it says, you have the meeting with Navarro on Saturday, you, the memorandum of Mick Mulvaney on Sunday, and on Monday, it says the National Security Council Policy Coordinating Committee met with Dr. Dire, met and directed Dr. Kalik and HHS to implement Navarro's recommendations. The push by the White House for HHS to ask more swiftly created tension between Dr. Bright and HHS political leadership. So it seems that, uh, I don't know how you could be more urgent in government than having a meeting on Saturday, a memorandum on Sunday, and actions on Monday, once it got to the president's attention, the president's level. So we appreciate the president uh, moving forward on that. I'm on the, the ranking member of ONI, which uh, the investigations, which you've testified in front of us before, and we appreciate that very much. So I'm kind of looking more at the process of putting the, this hearing together and some things. As, as we read through your complaint, the only way we have is because you made it public. And, and in your complaint, there are different exhibits that you, you talk about, and we're having a hearing today, and there are actually 33 exhibits referenced in your complaint that's not public. I think uh, we got them from the majority through the Washington Post or something like that. That's how we were made documents available for this hearing, in my understanding. So the 33 exhibits that are not made public that, go, that are referenced in your complaint, would you make those available to the committee? Do you have those and make them available to the committee? I mean, if we were using your, if we're using your complaint for this hearing, we need to uh, have the documentation. May I address that? Uh, with the chair, I, I don't have a problem with your address. Yes, we will take that under advisement and get back to you. Okay. Also, also when we read through the... the <laughs> there may be privacy considerations in some of the documents, so we do need to look at these documents carefully. So, let me say, so also, if we read through the email chains that are made available, some appear complete, but some tr uh, truly aren't. They're apparently not full email chains. And so you will wonder if the context of the email would relate to uh, the, the inferences taken from the emails. Would you make all the complete email chains available to us? I'd like to address sure. that as well, which is uh, a problem, is uh, when uh, Dr. Bright was removed from his position, he was locked out of his email. He does not have access to his full email. So the email, chain, so the, the email chains that you have available, we have. We have. That's correct. I he, can address. He does not have a full set of his email. 
I can address this too, and that's exactly right. So I, I was immediately locked out of my email uh, on uh, April 20th of this year, um, and so I didn't have full records available to me on that. However, I believe I laid a solid foundation in my complaint, as detailed as I could be, for the Office of Special Counsel to be able to conduct an investigation. I believe as part of their investigation, they'll be able to access those emails and, and individuals to get a full story and get the full information so they can get to the bottom of it. It would have been helpful for us as well. Uh, does, have you shared any of these exhibits with the majority that's not been shared with us in the minority side? Sir, I, I believe you have probably what's available in the public domain, and I believe the rest has been submitted to the Office of the Special Counsel, and I haven't made it available to anyone directly. To the, gen uh, to the gentleman, uh, the uh, minority and majority members all received the same packet of information. Which is available the emails, to the public. Yeah, uh -huh, okay. That was available that was in the public domain. Okay. So just one more. Are, are there any other documents in your possession or, or accessible to you, they're not included as exhibits in the complaint, but are nonetheless relevant to your allegations. If so, will you provide those to the committee? I believe I've provided the information I have available to me at this point. If I had access to my email um, from HHS, there might be additional supporting information in that email. I do not know the status if that's been deleted or wiped or I just haven't had access to it since April. Okay, what you have access to. I appreciate your answers. Thank you very much. I yield back. The gentleman yields back. Pleasure to recognize the gentleman from North Carolina, Mr. Butterfield, for his five minutes of questions. We still don't have enough testing supplies. Uh, I don't understand how and why that is possible. I understand that converting an auto plant to build ventilators might take a little time, but how can we be struggling to get adequate supplies of simple supplies like swabs? What does this say about the federal response to the coronavirus uh, outbreak? It says to me, sir, that there is no master coordinated plan on how to respond to this outbreak. We don't have a strategy or plan in place that identifies each of those critical components, and we don't have a designated agency that is sourcing those critical components and coming up with a strategy to make sure that we have those supplies when we need them. We need this comprehensive national strategy that's end-to-end -end about what includes every component to make sure we can respond and protect American lives. Thank you, Dr. Bright. You're a great American. Thank you very much. I yield back. The gentleman yields back. A uh, pleasure to recognize the gentleman from Virginia, Mr. Griffith, for his five minutes of questions. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Everything's going crazy. The people have all kinds of things going on. And this hydrochloroquine comes up, and there's some email exchanges in Exhibit 54 from your documents. All of these are floating out there. Doctors are using all kinds of things because we don't have other options. And so I'm wondering, what was the great hesitancy to at least let doctors try? And if it, even if anecdotally it was having some effect, wouldn't you have to have that available in order to be able to do the tests? And if you've got few or no options, why wouldn't you want to go down that pathway? We want to make sure that the drugs that we consider are safe and effective. The highest priority is safety. So many of these studies that we had or anecdotal evidence or, or reports we had did not include a thorough safety vetting of those drugs. There are some known side effects with some of the drugs. Many of these drugs were repurposed, so they weren't built de novo. So we knew about some of those potential safety concerns. And we didn't have any evidence of how those safety concerns would appear in people infected with this virus. This virus takes over a lot of your body and actually infects multiple organs in your body and causes significant inflammation and multi-organ shutdown in some cases before death. And acute respiratory distress syndrome it really turns your lungs into a brick. And it's so scary stuff. And you said, though, on hydro hydroquine that um, you know, one of the problems was you might have a, a heart, uh, irregular heartbeat. If you're worried about not having a heartbeat at all, that's really not, you're not worried about irregular if you don't have one at all. Am I not correct about that? I mean, that's the concern. People were dying out there, and here was the first one that showed some promise. Why wouldn't we want to accept, uh, you know, an offer from a manufacturer to give us a lot of this and have it out there for widespread use if the doctors chose, just like the doctor in Richmond? That didn't work in that case. They actually used it in there in that case, and it didn't work. 
So he tried something else. I mean, I think that's really what we're going to have to do in an emergency situation. Am I not correct? We need to do it carefully, sir. We have to make sure that when we have those, that information available, those potential drugs available, we are thinking outside the box. We're Can't we be so careful that we actually accidentally kill people? We need to true? move swiftly, sir. And we've yes, actually sir. to show that we could put up a clinical study in a matter of uh, less than a week. Okay. It's important to use the available clinical data. And if we know there are potential risks, we need to make sure that we're cognizant of those risks and make yep. sure those drugs are used in a very safe and controlled manner. Yes, sir. And I appreciate that, and I yield back. Thank you. Gentleman yields back. Uh, pleasure to recognize the gentlewoman from California, Ms. Matsui, for her five minutes of questions. Thank you very much, Madam Chair, and thank you, Dr. Bright, for appearing before us today, and thank you for your public service. On January 10th, you began pushing HHS leadership to obtain sequencing of virus samples. Given the importance of these samples for vaccine and diagnostic development, has the administration's inaction shortened or lengthened our timeline for reopening? Those samples were critical to get started as early as possible. There was delay in getting those samples. That means there'll be delay in getting those countermeasures. So those countermeasures are critical to reopening our country. Okay. It appears clear from the whistleblower report that the Trump administration prioritized political calculations above public health with regard to chloroquine and hydrochlor hydrochloroquine, despite the lack of data supporting the clinical benefits for the treatment and prevention of COVID-19. The Trump administration promoted the drug's use to the American people because it was seen as a big immediate win. Dr. Bright. Do you believe there are other instances where the administration relied on politics rather than science to make coronavirus response decisions? And what consequences might those decisions have had on public health? We have a very rigorous scientific review process for all of the investments that we make for the drugs, vaccines, and diagnostics through BARDA and through our department, actually. And so there were some attempts to bypass that rigorous vetting process that caused me great concern and actually increase the tension between me and Dr. Cadillac. Um, without that scientific vetting, that does increase the risk of a drug being evaluated or supported that could have safety concerns. The Trump administration waited until April to invoke the Defense Production Act to increase the production of life-saving medical supplies like masks, months after doctors began experiencing shortages, and three months after your initial January warnings. Should HHS have invoked the Defense Act earlier to increase the domestic production of critical med medical supplies, like masks and swabs? I'm actually I'm not an expert on the Defense Production Act and how it's used most effectively. I do believe that we should have been doing everything possible, placing orders early, ramping up supply, ramp ramping up production of those critical um, medical equipment as quickly as, as possible, whether or not that's through the Defense Production Act or other mechanisms. It should have been a high priority. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Bright. I run out of time, and thank you very much for appearing before us today. The gentlewoman yields back. A pleasure to recognize the gentleman from Florida, Mr. Belarakis, thank for you, his Madam five Chair. minutes. I appreciate it very much, and I want to thank Dr. Bright as well uh, for your service to our country. Uh, I have a few questions, and I'm focusing on the hydroxychloroquine. Uh, when was the when was the potential use? of chloroquine and hydroxychloroquine uh, as treatment for the COVID-19 first brought to your attention, sir? I believe it's probably uh, um, mid-March, um, between March 10th and March 17th, somewhere in that time frame. And not prior to that? Not that I recall. The first I heard of the, the, the drug itself was a, a call I received from Dr. Woodcock at the FDA asking if I'd heard of the drug. And I hadn't heard of the drug, and I hadn't heard of its potential use for COVID-19 patients. She said there might be something interesting to look at. You weren't aware of any news articles and research papers in January discussing the potential benefits of the drug? I had heard anecdotal stories and re reports, sir. You uh, had? I had okay. probably, I can't recall if I did specifically for chloroquine, but I tried to track the, the media and the, the scientific journal as well, however, I rely on the guidance of the science within HHS, and the first I had heard of that was from uh, my colleague, Dr. Woodcock at the FDA, and then a summary report from our scientists at FDA, CDC, NIH, and BARDA 
that indicated that the evidence for its benefit was weak and the evidence for its safety concerns was stronger. And they did not believe at that point it was something that should be supported. Okay, now again, uh, what was your reaction personally? Uh, did you think it was something worth pursuing initially when you heard from Dr. Woodcock? Initially, I said, I, I, I do believe, if, I mean, I trust Dr. Woodcock and her scientific judgment immensely. And if she mentioned that this is something that we should look at, then it's something we should consider testing in a randomized controlled clinical study. I would be supportive of the team reviewing that protocol and that information to see if it should be used. Right, sir, you know, I understand, I've heard from experts, and I'm certainly not an ex expert in this area, that, uh, that the drug, the one that we're talking about, in this case, hydroxychloroquine, um, if it's used, uh, first of all, uh, timely, because I know, I understand there's a window there uh, as far as the patient, the, the effective, the efficacy of, of the drug. Um, have you heard this, that, uh, that if it's administered properly, uh, there's, a, there's a small window there for the patient as far as uh, uh, risk is concerned. Uh, have you, can you elaborate a little bit on that if you've heard that? And again, this is not from, uh, from a lay person, this is from, from an expert. We have seen anecdotal, heard of anecdotal data from different physicians that they believe they've seen benefit or patient improvement from use of this drug in either combination with an antibiotic azithromycin or a combination with um, uh, zinc or, or other vitamin C or other things. But there was never sufficient evidence from a randomized controlled study to show its benefit would actually outweigh the potential risk. Not my constituent, but a U.S. citizen uh, who, uh, a veteran, uh, was cured. Uh, again, this is just from what I've heard from, from the drug. Uh, and uh, that, that was a late stage case, but I've also heard of early stage cases as well. So I wanted to get that on record. Thank you, Madam Chair. He yields back. Uh, pleasure to recognize the gentlewoman from Florida, Ms. Castor, for her five minutes of questions. Thank you, Madam Chair. Dr. Bright, thank you for speaking out to save lives. Dr. Bright, you understood that America would face a shortage of respirators in January. Is that right? We understood America would face a shortage of N95 respirators for a pandemic response in 2007. And we have exercised and known and evaluated that number almost every year since 2007. It was exercised even as late as early as 2019, August in Crimson Contagion, that we would need 3.5 billion N95 respirators in our stockpile to protect our healthcare workers from a pandemic response. And you sounded the alarm repeatedly, uh, but were ignored by the senior leadership at the Department of Health and Human Services. Please explain what steps that you took and the response you, re you received. We knew going into this pandemic that critical medical equipment would be in short supply. I began getting alerts from industry colleagues in, in, in mid and early, mid and late January telling me that from an outside view, from the industry view, that the supply chain was diminishing rapidly, telling me that other countries were, that we relied on to supply many of these masks were blocking export and, and stopping transfer of those masks to the United States. I learned that um, China was trying to buy the equipment from the United States producers to have it shipped to China so they could make more. And each of these alerts, and there were dozens of these alerts, I pushed those forward to our leadership in ASPR, to Dr. Cadillac and his senior leadership team. I pushed those warnings to our critical infrastructure protection team. I pushed those warnings to our strategic national stockpile team, who has the responsibility of procuring those medical supplies for our stockpile. In each of those, I was met with uh, dip indifference. Um, saying they were either too busy, they didn't have a plan, they didn't know who was responsible for procuring those. Um, in some cases, they had a sick child and, and would get back to it later in the week. Uh, a number of excuses, but never any action. In, in your whistleblower filing, you discuss a February 7th meeting of the department leadership group, but which you 
urge the department to focus on securing N95 masks. Can you describe what happened at that meeting? They informed me that they did not think, believe there was a critical urgency to procure masks. They conducted some surveys, talked to a few hospitals and some companies, and they didn't yet see a critical shortage. And I indicated that we know there will be a critical shortage of these supplies. We need to do something to ramp up production. They indicated if we notice there is a shortage that we will simply change the CDC guidelines to better inform people who should not be wearing those masks so that would save those masks for our healthcare workers. My response was, I cannot believe you can sit and say that with a straight face. In that fact, was an absurd. In fact, it took three months from your initial warnings. Uh, until mid-April for the federal government to invoke its authority under the Defense Production Act to require the production of millions of more N95 masks. And even then, the administration required the production of only 39 million masks, which is far fewer than you and other experts said that we would need. What was the consequence of this three-month delay and inadequate response? Were lives endangered? Lives were endangered, and I believe lives were lost. And, and not only that, we were forced to procure these supplies from other countries without the right quality standards. So even our doctors and nurses in the hospitals today are wearing N95 marked masks from other countries that are not providing the sufficient protection that a U.S. standard N95 mask would provide them. Some of those masks are only 30 percent effective. Therefore, nurses are rushing in the hospitals thinking they're protected, and they're not. Thank you for your courageous effort. Gentlewoman's time has expired. A pleasure to recognize uh, our colleague from Indiana, Dr. Bouchon, for his five minutes. Thank question. you, Madam Chairwoman, and thank you, Dr. Bright, for testifying. I, I appreciate it. I, I was a cardiovascular and thoracic surgeon from, and been in healthcare for over 30 some years. So I, I want to comment on, no, I'm not going to ask a question about hydroxychloroquine. I just want to comment on how the medical community responds to this type of thing. Doctors across the country will use drugs off-label in, in a circumstance where they don't have or they don't see a viable alternative to that. And I think this is one of those circumstances. I hear, I'm hearing from doctors across the country. And look, I'm with you. You have to have double-blind studies. You have to have proof in an, under normal circumstances. But in this situation, I think a, a little bit of uh, understanding and leeway from the federal government is in order. Um, we do want to ensure the safety. This is a drug that has been proven safe for many, many years in the appropriate doses. It does prolong the QT interval, as you, you've outlined, which is, can lead to cardiac arrhythmias if not used properly. Um, but I mean, tell you, when states tried to stop doctors from using this, there was such a backlash, they had to back away from it because the physicians in the community wanted to use it. And so doctors like me out in the real world, if things are working, even anecdotally, they're not going to wait for the government bureaucracy to approve it. I just want to get that on the record. I'm just saying this is why doctors are using this drug. Whether it's right or not, data will show. But, you know, if two years from now we have the studies and we say, hey, that stuff really would have worked, and the government stopped that from being used, if I was a family of a person that was stopped from getting hydroxychloroquine, I'd be pretty mad. I want to talk about the supply chain issues and uh, as it relates to PPE, the personal protective equipment. And I, I think there's enough blame to go around in the federal government about what happened there. For, you know, after H1N1, where our national stockpiles were depleted, we didn't, re we didn't replenish them. We've had people on both sides of the aisle talking about this. And it's, I, I think there's some, something to, some blame to go around. But, you know, I don't, I don't want to be accusatory, but I do want to go over some of the facts about BARDA situation as it relates to the masks, okay? And according to Washington Post report in 2015, the Obama administration and, and a company now known as O&M Howard, Halyard, H-A-L-Y-A-R-D, announced a project to develop rapid pandemic mask production line. According to federal contracting records in 2017, HHS signed off on a 3.3 million, with an M, payment to Howard, Halyard to build a machine that could churn out millions of protective respiratory masks at a high rate of speed during a pandemic. However, in September of 2018, CNBC reported that the machine was never built. And despite BARDA's $1.5 billion, with a B, budget, 
The Washington Post reported there wasn't money to pay for the project. Why was the project scrapped, and did you sign off on that decision? So that um, dis that project with Halyard was to build a r novel new machine to make a respiratory protection face masks faster, as you described accurately. Right. Um, actually, the technical team must have reviewed that proposal on the next step or the in further investment in that machine. I believe that the investment to date was made to design the machine, build the blueprint of the machine, and I'm not even sure if it was to build it. At that time in September 2018, machine. were you the head of BARDA? In 2018, I was the director of BARDA. Right, so did you sign off on the decision? Because I would expect a decision like that, a contract, money was allocated apparently from HHS uh, to BARDA to, to do this. I wouldn't expect that to be scrapped without the director of BARTA signing off on that, right? So did you sign off on it? It's a yes or no question. Not necessarily scrapped the project, sir. I don't know what the proposal was that we rely okay. on a very thorough vetting process Understood. through our contracting office. So that proposal to further continue that project never made it to me. So if it wasn't approved, it, it didn't make it through the proper vetting process in BARTA. I did, the decision to end or continue that project was not brought to me. Okay, I find that surprising, but I'll take your word for it. Uh, Nicole Lurie, uh, who hired you, told the Washington Post that the Halyard contract was part of an explicit strategy to ensure we could surge mass production in the next crisis. Well, now we're here and we don't have it. So we're dealing with the consequences of that decision. Uh, and talk in the abstract about people dying in our intensive care units, but when you're the physician at the bedside and there is a medication that has promise, and that has a safety profile that we understand, doctors will use this medication uh, off, you know, uh, offline. And uh, that's what's happening. And, uh, you know, whether that's right or wrong, we might take us years to prove, but in the meantime, um, people can die. So I yield back. Gentlemen's Comments, time has expired. Uh, it's a pleasure to recognize uh, the gentleman from Maryland, Mr. Sarbanes, for his five minutes of questions. Um, thank you, Madam Chair. Dr. Bright, welcome back to this uh, committee. Unfortunately, the record shows that your superiors at HHS and potentially beyond, instead of valuing your expertise and experience, squandered it in ways that in this moment, in the face of this crisis, amount to gross negligence. They ignored your science-based pleas to pursue critical strategies, for example, your repeated calls to obtain virus samples from China and to find supplies, masks, respirators, swabs. They dismissed your science-based warnings about pursuing unproven strategies. Um, they dismissed your concern, for example, about the stampeding towards hydroxychloroquine. We've heard about that today. Uh, and they sent you on errant missions to find treatments with little therapeutic value all for the sake of satisfying political cronies. And you've testified about the miracle cure drug that was an example of that. Ignoring, dismissing your input was not harmless malpractice because there is every reason to believe that if that input had been heeded, particularly your pleas for action in the early days of the pandemic, it might have saved thousands of lives. I wanna thank you for coming forward. I wanna thank you for blowing the whistle on the misguided and chaotic response to this pandemic. So here we are at a moment when our country needs the kind of expertise and science-based guidance that you and others like you can offer us. These voices are too often being sidelined. Things are upside down. In you, we have someone who made the right call in the early days and has been removed from your position. While so many people who made the wrong call still have their jobs. Dr. Bright, when the counsel that you and others offer is cast aside, and I know you know this, it means that science and reason are also being cast aside. That's a dangerous impulse. It's an attitude that deprives our country in this critical moment of any real chance of getting ahead of this pandemic. The federal response has got to get smarter. 
It has to put science ahead of politics and cronyism and wishful thinking. And I yield back. The gentleman's time has expired and he yields back. Uh, pleasure to recognize the gentlewoman from Indiana, uh, Ms. Brooks, for five minutes for her questions. Thank you, Madam Chairwoman. Um, Dr. Bright, um, with all due respect, uh, the Vice President was named the head of the Coronavirus White House Task Force, which was actually a recommendation from a bipartisan Blue Ribbon Study Panel. Uh, that issued recommendations years ago and thought the office of the vice president ought to be in charge of the response. And so, with all due respect, um, I, I believe there, there is that coordination. And part of what I'm very, very concerned relative to this hearing is that there's the impression being made that there's been no plan. Um, and in fact, that's part of what the reauthorization of PAPA that I worked closely with you, Dr. Kablik, that Congresswoman Eshoo, Dr. Burgess, so many of us relied on you all to share with us what we needed to do to reauthorize PAPA, which most members of Congress really didn't know what that was, Pandemic All Hazard Preparedness Act. Most members of Congress and most members of the American public didn't know we had strategic national stockpiles and that we might actually be short some of these things until this all hit. Um, but we did get that reauthorized, and it was signed into law in June of 19. Do you recall that? Yes. And, and Dr. Bright, you joined BARDA to lead the Influenza Division 2010 right after H1N1 because of your expertise, and we rely on your expertise, and you became director in 2016. After, and you mentioned it in 07, but after the 2009 H1N1 pandemic, the supply of masks in the strategic national stockpile was not resupplied. You've mentioned that actually we've had a problem since 07. So, but I have to share with you, members like Congresswoman Eshoo and I who've had discussions about this, many of us really didn't know that. We, as members of this committee, did not know and were not told of these shortages of masks as we worked through reauthorization of this important law. Were you aware of this issue and did you push HHS to maintain mass production for purposes of replenishing the strategic national stockpile before this happened in January? There's always been limited funding and never enough to completely top off the stockpile. Did you know, Doc, did you know Greg Burrell? I do. He retired yes. uh, prior to all of this happening. He led the strategic national stockpile. Yes. Did you have conversations with Greg Burrell from 2009 until 2020 about what was in the strategic national stockpile? It was the strategic national stockpile's responsibility to make those purchases. And how about FEMC? Does BARDA participate in FEMC? And would you please very, very briefly, because my time is limited, explain what FEMC is. This is a plan that experts like yourselves participate in. So I want the American people to know there have been plans. There have been plans that FEMC had forth a 2017-18 implementation plan. The White House put forth the, in September of 2018 a national biodefense plan. Did you participate? in that national biodefense plan? I did, and many of us did. And, and it was the first time that our country had actually put forth a national biodefense plan. Many said it was kind of landmark. And same thing with FEMC, putting forth many plans. So I want the American people to know, a lot of folks over a long period of time have been focused, but yet we did not still have enough. We didn't have enough swabs, we didn't have enough masks, we don't have enough gowns for all of those incredible healthcare providers. So I don't want everyone to be given the impression that you raised the flag just in January, okay, when you saw it was short, because you hadn't gotten the job done prior to January, and you were at those tables, as were so many others. This w happened over a very, very long period of time. And those of us have been very disappointed to learn what was and was not in the strategic national stockpile. I thank you for your service. I thank you for your expertise. But across the board, over many administrations, we did not do enough. And I yield back. Uh, pleasure to recognize uh, the gentleman from New Mexico.
Mr. Lujan, for your five minutes of questions. Thank, thank you, Madam Chair. Dr. Bright, you've described pressure from senior Trump administration officials to promote the malaria drug chloroquine and hydroxychloroquine to treat COVID-19 despite the lack of scientific support for this treatment. According to your account, when Bayer offered to donate chloroquine pills to the strategic national stockpile on March 17, your team of experts at HHS determined that, quote, there are safety liabilities associated with the drug, close quote, and that, quote, accepting the donation could lead to widespread use that is not supported by any clinical data, close quote. Further, one of the public health experts advising you said, quote, no data available to support that chloroquine provides clinical benefit to the treatment or prevention of COVID-19, close quote. Yes or no, Dr. Bright, are there safety liabilities associated with chloroquine? There are, yes. Dr. Bright, I want to end by quoting your testimony, quote, without clear planning and implementation of the steps that I and other experts have outlined, 2020 will be the darkest winter in modern history. The darkest winter in modern history. Yes or no, do you believe this administration is doing everything it can to prevent the darkest winter? And what more should they be doing? I believe there's a lot of work that we still need to do. Say, so we need to see all the documents as a committee. So that's all I'm after. Madam Chairman, Just the may I address one point? No, I think that uh, I think we need to move on. Uh, the gentleman from Oregon is recognized, uh, Mr. Schrader. Thank you. Thank you for being here, uh, Dr. Bright. Really appreciate it. Tough to do. Very impressive that you're here. So I guess my major point here is that we have uh, a brave individual coming forward as a whistleblower, but he is not alone. There are many other experts, uh, scientists, uh, and manufacturers that realized we were in, if I may say, deep shit uh, not a long time ago, long before the administration and the White House began to wake up. What do you, uh, what do you think would have happened if Mr. Navarro had not re reached out to you and actually responded to you? What, where would we be now if you hadn't been able to at least to get one person in the White House's attention? Great, Gentlemen's thank you very time much. time has expired. Uh, and he yields back. Uh, pleasure to recognize the gentleman from North Carolina, Mr. Hudson, for his five minutes of questions. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, first, let me say I believe any whistleblower should be respected and allowed to be heard as a core component of keeping our government accountable and running smoothly. But this hearing is not about a whistleblower complaint. It's about undermining the administration during a national and global crisis. I hope today will be held up in the future as a lesson of what not to do and the respect and gravity that should be given to whistleblower complaints so that they're not abused for political expediency. I hear from providers and hospitals about issues with PPE. I know this administration has done extraordinary things to secure more PPE. I want to thank President Donald Trump for his strong leadership. Not only did his administration move quickly to coordinate a response, but his travel ban on January 30th was a bold move, though it was panned by his critics as an overreaction at the time. The administration has gone to great lengths to overcome an inadequate system they inherited. And as you testified earlier, move quickly to start programs like Project Airbridge to expedite more PPE coming in. But questions remain about why there is a global shortage and what more Congress can do to support the administration's efforts to secure sufficient PPE. This committee should be working on that question. Dr. Bright, you're no doubt an accomplished scientist, and I appreciate the service you've rendered to this country. You deserve to be heard, and your whistleblower complaint should be given the serious consideration any whistleblower complaint deserves. But we also deserve to have the opportunity to ask questions about serious allegations that have been made against you. And I'll note again, this is not the time or place for that hearing. The time is after the Office of Special Counsel has completed its work, and the place is the Oversight and Investigations Committee. But Dr. Bright, building on questions from Mr. Walden and others, uh, Politico released an article yesterday stating that your complaint left out a lot of information and context regarding agency decisions to acquire hydro hydroxychloroquine. You chose not to elevate your concerns to the officers of the Inspector General, but instead kept selected screenshots that didn't include full context. Another example, the Wall Street Journal reported in an e on an email today that seems to show that you were in support of acquiring the, and using hydroxychloroquine. Can you elaborate on what was missing from your screenshots and why you didn't elevate your concerns at any time to the Office of Inspector General? It was only after I learned that that supply that was being discussed was coming in from Pakistan and from India from facilities that were not approved by the FDA and the drug was not approved for use in the United States that I became increasingly alarmed of having that drug in the United States. 
Second, it was when I learned that the plan was to make that drug available through an expanded access program so people could potentially get that drug and not be under the close supervision of a health care provider, that caused significant concern. It's because of that and the cascading days afterwards that we put in that emergency use authorization with the safety bumpers and barriers that we could feel comfortable with that that drug would only be used under close clinical supervision. But in the earlier days, in that email exchange that you're referring to, was before we knew about this information in Pakistan, before we knew it was going to be used for expanded access clinical, or expanded access protocol. It was when I thought our efforts to obtain some of that drug would be used at the NIH to conduct randomized controlled clinical studies. So I was relieved that we did identify some supplies of that drug for those clinical studies. My time's expired, Madam Chair. I yield back. The gentleman yields back. Um, uh, pleasure to recognize the gentleman from Massachusetts, Mr. Kennedy, for his five minutes of questions. Dr. Bright, thank you very much for being here, and thank you for your service to our country. Sir, you're aware um, at the end of the Obama administration, the Obama team put together a playbook to try to guide succeeding administrations on how to handle a, uh, an outbreak, correct? Yes. Um, sir, are you, um, when did you first have concerns about the potential impact of COVID-19 on the United States? In early January. And were you aware that your supervisor, Dr. Cadillac, suggested uh, that um, the uh, uh, activation of the Defense Production Act in mid-January? I wasn't aware of him doing that, no. Um, are you aware that the Trump administration budget proposal released in February of 2020 called for a cut to CDC by nearly $700 million? I'm not aware of that. I've heard of it. Um, are you familiar with a memo written by Peter Navarro that warned of the impact of the virus? Yes. Are you uh, aware that it was spread among senior administration and White House officials? Yes. Are you aware that it was on or about April 2nd when the Trump administration finally activated uh, and expanded the Defense Production Act months after being warned by you and other senior administration officials? I'm, I've learned of that. Has the Coronavirus Task Force actually developed a plan for reopening the country? I'm not aware of the full plan to reopen, sir. Can we possibly say that this administration has prepared our country for what it, the moment that we are in and how we could possibly be prepared for the distribution, development, manufacturing, and distribution of a vaccine to try to address 330 million Americans over the course of the months ahead? I think we have a lot of work to do to be prepared, sir. You are I don't too think we're kind. fully prepared. Thank you, sir. Yield back. Gentleman yields back. Okay, you can reserve, and we'll go to uh, the gentleman from California, Mr. Cardenas, for his five minutes of questions. Thank you, uh, Dr. Bright, for, for being here today. When an administration or decision makers prioritize politics over science, does that tend to increase or decrease the likely uh, um, results of the loss of life in the middle of a pandemic? I believe the scientists are best equipped to understand how to manage a public health crisis, and I believe scientists should lead. I believe that you've been incredibly consistent in your willingness to dedicate yourself, your expertise, and your career to saving lives. Is the loss of life on your mind, was that on your mind when you decided that you needed to enact your right to be a whistleblower? The, the, my, I've spent my career focused on saving lives, and sir, everything I've done to come forward now is to raise awareness of challenges we have, things that are not getting done, because I do think it will save more lives. Um, <sighs> we've, hear, we've heard boasting from the White House about millions of, of personal protective equipment, PPEs, as everybody knows them as, millions have gone out to America. But fact, to date, we should have had billions gone out throughout America. Isn't that the disparity? That's a huge disparity, and, and healthcare workers are having to compromise their protection and their health and safety because they're having to be creative and, and reuse a single mask for the entire week or come up with novel sterilization practices that are not proven or tested yet. So that disparity actually is impacting our frontline workers, and those are the people whose lives we really need to preserve so they can treat others. 
Uh, a pleasure to recognize Mr. Long from uh, Missouri for his five minutes of questions. Thank you, Madam Chairwoman. And uh, Dr. Bright, you contend that your removal uh, was because the Trump administration and HHH leadership in particular lack scientific integrity. Do you think that Dr. Fauci lacks scientific integrity? Sir, I don't think my removal has anything associated with Dr. Fauci at all. I think my removal is because of tensions and actions I took between my advisor, my supervisor, Dr. Cadillac, and myself. Do you know about Dr. Fauci's testimony two days before at the Senate Health Committee? I'm aware of that testimony, yes. If HHH leadership is so hostile to scientific integrity, as you say, as you allege, uh, how do you explain Dr. Fauci being allowed to testify forthrightly to serve in a prominent role on the White House Task Force, the administration, and direct NIAID's extensive research efforts? So I'm not sure what decisions are involved in, in, in allowing Dr. Fauci to testify or not. That's not something. Can you say that again? I'm, I'm, not, I'm not sure. I'm not aware of what process or decisions are involved in allowing Dr. Fauci to testify or not. But he involved. was allowed to testify. I know he was, but I, I thought I understood you to ask me if, if that was appropriate or if he was not being allowed to. Maybe you can repeat your question if I misunderstood it. Okay. What I'm saying is you're saying HHS is hostile to scientific integrity. And if that's the case, can you explain why Dr. Fauci was allowed to testify forthrightly in the committee? If they're hostile to it, why would you let him come out and testify without any no hold barred? I'm saying that my supervisor uh, was not uh, following proper scientific process that we have in place for BARDA. I'm not actually saying the administration is hostile uh, against scientific integrity in all cases. So I'm saying in my particular situation, in my, as in my claim, my supervisor was um, conducting an inappropriate activity that was going around proper scientific vetting. That is and what I put why, in my claim. Why did you not? bring these concerns to Secretary Azar or his chief or the Inspector General, why did you not bring any of them into the loop and say, hey, I have these concerns? Sir, I believe some of the activities um, were not it's isolated with Dr. Cadillac. I think some of his senior staff was also aware of some of the processes that were being utilized to go around our traditional review process, scientific review process. But what normal protocol in any situation be that you go to the secretary of HHS or his chief of staff or the inspector general with your concern instead of just gathering them up and deciding that one day you're going to? Well, I didn't decide that. I, I, I was pushed out, sir, and, 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 and involuntarily transferred without no, my but knowledge. But you had these concerns, so why didn't you take them to your superiors when you had the concerns and maybe none of this, maybe we wouldn't be here today? It wasn't easy for any of us to get here today. Sir, I requested that an IG investigation, as is my claim, it's, I think it was in 2018, uh, that they look into what I believe was inappropriate pressure, political pressure on some of our contracting activities in discussion about procurement integrity. And I do not think that that was ever followed through on. So I did. Did you bring have, your concerns to the Inspector General? I do not believe they were followed up through and, and submitted to the Inspector General. I raised those concerns to our HHS. But you personally didn't General. talk to the Inspector General, didn't I raise did the not. concerns with the Inspector General or with Azar's chief or with Azar, correct? I raised those with the Secretary's Office of General Counsel. They were present in that meeting, sir. I'll take that as a no. Okay. You state in your testimony that HHH leadership was demissive about your predictions about the broader outbreak and the pressing need to act. However, it's my understanding that it was Dr. Redfield at CDC who alerted the White House's National Security Council about the risk of the virus on January the 2nd, and a high-level team with the NSC's Counterproliferation and Biodefense Directorate quickly began meeting to address the possibility of a pandemic. Do you consider Dr. Redfield's actions here to be dismissive about the threat of a coronavirus? Sir, so if people were aware of the urgency, what was lacking was the action and how to address the urgency. So when we were raising issues on critical supply chain of medical equipment to protect doctors and nurses, if they're aware of the urgency of the situation and still failed to act 
They think that is even more unconscionable than not being aware of the emergency and not acting. Okay. In your new position, I would recommend that if you have issues, you might go to the head of the department, his chief, and some folks like that. I yield back. Gentleman yields back. Uh, pleasure to um, yield to the gentleman from Vermont, Mr. Welch. Uh, thank you very much. Your job, our job, is to protect the American people. And this fierce virus can be managed if done correctly, correct? I believe so. And in fact, the playbook is established. It's so it's uh, testing, contact tracing, and then isolation, starting with first social isolation, correct? Yes, as non-pharmaceutical interventions and testing are critical first steps. Right, and in fact, this virus is across the world and many countries that have followed that tried and true protocol have done far better than the US, is that correct? We have seen differences in the response and the outcomes of that response around I'll, the world. I'll go through some of those. And you know, the John Hopkins study that said that the US had the best preparedness, it turned out we have the worst response, correct? With the most cases and the most deaths. We have the most cases and the most deaths. And I did some calculations. You know, on January 19th, South Korea determined its first case on January 19th, the U.S. determined its first case, correct? January 20th was the U.S., yes. All right. And if we had the same response to South Korea by population, they had 33,000 deaths. That would have, we would have saved 50,000 lives. In Taiwan, they had the same virus, 22,000 deaths. And again, adjusting for population, that's 60,000 more deaths we've had here. Singapore, 82,000 more deaths. New Zealand, 65,000. The question for us here and for the American people is why? When we had the best plan, we had the worst execution. So let me go through a few things that you've established. One, beginning in January, before that first case here, FDA Chief Han asked the HHS if he could start contacting companies about possible shortage of protective equipment, and he got blown off by HHS, correct? That I understand. And on January 18th, before our first case, you pushed Dr. Kaldek to convene high-level meetings about the virus, but that was initially rejected, correct? True. And then on January 23rd, you demanded urgent access to funding personnel and clinical specimens to develop life-saving medicines, but you were told that the spread was under control, correct? There wasn't a shared sense of urgency. On January 25th, you warned others in the administration there's a critical need for procuring surgical mask. That was ignored, correct? True. On January 27th, you participated in the daily COVID-19 meeting where you expressed frustration with the slow pace of accessing virus samples and clinical specimens from China. You were reprimanded and you're no longer part of those meetings. Is that right? That's true. So you and others actually were seeing over the horizon what was coming to our shores, even before our first case was confirmed, correct? We had spent many years preparing for a pandemic, sir, and we understood the threat. We understood what we needed, we needed to do. Exactly. It's knowable and it's manageable. It's fierce and fearsome. But what you have to do is established. Is that more or less correct? Yes, sir. We just didn't do it. February 25th, President Trump gave an assurance that the stock market is starting to look very good and the coronavirus was very much under control. Were you aware of any medically involved people who had the view that the virus at that time was very much under control? No, sir, I don't think the virus was under control. I don't think many people would agree with me in the scientific realm. Now, in those countries I mentioned, it includes Germany, Taiwan, New Zealand, South Korea, Singapore. The leaders of those countries accepted that there was a role only the nation could play and the provinces would have to depend on them for that. And I wanna go through some of those things. One, establishing a, press, a testing protocol. Was that done here? No. 
Two, acquiring and allocating and distributing the personal protective equipment to where it was needed when it was needed. Was that done here? No, sir. In fact, we had governors in hospitals competing with each other to try to get desperately needed equipment. Isn't that correct? There's a lot of confusion, a lot of competition, and, and, and bad decisions made to acquire poor quality product. Right. In any of those other countries that I just mentioned, are you aware of the leader of that country at a press conference making recommendations on what kind of medication people should use? I don't know the details of what happened in those countries, sir, so I don't know. All right. you know. We had governors here, Republicans and Democrats, Republicans like Hogan, like Phil Scott from Vermont, who have done a tremendous job, but no matter how good they do their job, can they protect their people without the aggressive intervention of the federal government playing its role? I think the federal government plays a critical role in coordinating and aligning and, and making an equitable distribution of those critical supplies. I believe that's what we'd practice and, and exercise in the past, that there would be a critical role for the federal lead in coordination at the state, local, and tribal and territorial levels. Thank you, Dr. Bright. I yield back. The gentleman yields back. Um, the gentleman from California, Mr. Ruiz, is uh, recognized for five minutes of questions. Dr. Ruiz. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Bright. Thank you for your testimony here, and thank you for your service to our country. My heart aches for the family and friends of the over 80,000 in America who have died of COVID-19 in such a short period of time. Uh, in fact, uh, my heart aches for those closer to me. The, the Riverside County has reported 228 deaths. As a doctor, I appreciate your written testimony that states that science, not politics or cronyism, must lead the way to combat this deadly virus. There has been a lot of hype about cures for COVID that have been shown to be ineffective and even dangerous. We are now seeing the very real dangers and consequences of not making decisions based on science. Hydroxychloroquine, which Fox News uh, commentators and then the White House repeatedly touted and actually encouraged people to use, is Exhibit A on this list. Uh, but there is one drug that appears to provide some therapeutic benefit, remdesivir. Two weeks ago, Dr. Fauci announced that remdesivir showed a clear-cut, significant positive effect in diminishing the time to recovery. My understanding is that in January and early February, you launched a comprehensive review to assess which existing drugs might prove a therapeutic benefit, and you quickly identified remdesivir as the most likely drug to be effective against COVID-19. Can you describe how you came to that conclusion, who you told within HHS, and what the response was? Yes, so that conclusion was, was, came about by an, a, a technical review from a number of scientists within HHS, so the CDC, FDA, NIH, and BARDA, but it was also aligned with a scientific assessment from WHO and a number of global experts who rapidly looked at every potential drug and ranked remdesivir as the drug that had the most potential for benefit. Who did you tell and what was the response? Uh, we shared that information with uh, Dr. Cadillac. We share that information um, within HHS leadership as well. We had discussions about the uh, actions that could be considered for acquiring the limited supply of remdesivir. What was the response? And we had uh, discussions about how to ramp up production of more remdesivir in case the randomized controlled clinical study that the NIH was conducting came through with positive. And so you had a discussion, and what was the response? Did anything happen? Um, no decision was made okay. at that time. My understanding is that Peter Navarro, the White House Trade Advisor, reached out to you on February 7th to seek your counsel. You told him about your top three concerns, the shortage of N95 masks, the need for a quote-unquote Manhattan Project to develop vaccines and securing adequate supplies of remdesivir. Can you tell us if Mr. Navarro agreed with you and what steps you and he took? Mr. Navarro did agree with me on, on the remdesivir, the N95 mask, and the Vaccine Manhattan Project, and he drafted a memo on, on February 9th okay. um, to the, the, the White House Chief of Staff and, and Mick Mulvaney to share with the White House Task Force. The directive for HHS to act on remdesivir occurred on February 10th. What happened next, and did the department promptly pro procure the needed supplies of remdesivir? We did not proceed with procuring any supplies of remdesivir. Okay. You were removed from your position on April 22nd. By the time you were removed, had the department settled on a plan and procured the remdesivir? 
No, sir. They were still okay. discussing um, slide so, presentations about potential donations so, from Desivere at that time. So what you are describing is a gang that couldn't shoot straight, and yet we are in the middle of a pandemic. There is one drug the experts say could make a difference, and in fact has been shown to make a difference, yet the department can't seem to figure out how to acquire it. A week ago, the Washington Post published an article on the rollout of remdesivir, describing it as, quote, confusing, unfair, and marred with incomplete medical information, unquote. Doctors described how they can't obtain the drug and don't understand the process for accessing it. Dr. Benjamin Linas from the Boston Medical Center said, quote, there's no transparency. The process is just a staggering injustice. Dr. Bright, you were warning about this over three months ago. If the department had listened to you and the other experts at your agency, could this fiasco have been avoided? We would have had a plan, sir. We should have had a plan for that drug and any other drug in limited supply. So it didn't have to be this way. Right. Here's what I don't understand. You were right about the dangers of hydroxychloroquine. You were right about the benefits of remdesivir. You were right about N95 masks and other critical issues. Yet you got fired from your job while officials who botched the response and ignored your warnings stay in theirs. Not only is this unfair to you, it's completely dangerous to the American people. I yield back my time. The gentleman yields back. Okay, uh, I now have the pleasure of recognizing the only pharmacist in the United States Congress, Mr. Carter. <laughs> Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Mr. Dr. Bright, for being here, and thank you for your service to our country. And before I begin, let me extend my condolences to those 80,000 plus who have lost their lives and to their families as a result of this pandemic, and a shout out to all of our healthcare professionals, as well as our other essential workers who have, who have put their own health in danger and, in order to provide services to our citizens. We've had a lot of discussion today about hydroxychloroquine, about chloroquine, and I'm a little bit confused here because it's my understanding that this is what BARDA, do you want to clarify something here? All right, I see you. Okay. Um, it's my understanding that, that that's what the, the role of BARDA, the, the, the mission of BARDA is to, to look at things like this. In fact, when we in Congress appropriate, allocate money to go toward this, that you are supposed to be looking, that BARDA is supposed to be looking at things that could possibly have merit, such as hydroxychloroquine and chloroquine. And early on, it appeared that you, you embraced that. And early on, it seemed that you were in favor of looking at that. And I'm just wondering, um, because of this pandemic, because we didn't have any vaccine or any, any kind of agreed upon treatment, we, we should be testing and we should, that's what we are appropriating that money for. Would you agree with that? That that's what we are, are trying to do is to look at what could possibly work and, and, and work with public companies to try to, to encourage them to come up with those kind of uh, solutions? Absolutely. We should look at all options and make sure we evaluate the potential risk and safety and benefit of those in the context of a randomized controlled clinical study. In the context of an emergency, we should move swiftly and get that clinical data as urgently and quickly as possible, but we should not re uh, proceed recklessly without that clinical data on its potential adverse events in an emergency. So you're referring when you say we should not proceed adversely, uh, the, you're referring to hydroxychloroquine and the chloroquine? We are, we were promoting the standing up of randomized controlled clinical studies at the NIH with hydroxychloroquine. I worked with a company to even ask if they would donate drug to the NIH to be used in the context of a randomized controlled clinical study. Right. Yes, so that is what BARDA would and, do. And in fact, I think you worked with the FDA to get an emergency use for, for hydroxychloroquine, is that correct? And that was actually approved by the FDA. That was in the context of the directive we received from the secretary's office to stand up an expanded access protocol. Our clinicians. So, are you saying you FDA. you were instructed to do that, and you did it against your will, or? So we were instructed to put in place an expanded access protocol. So, in in the context that Americans would be able to access this drug and not be under the close supervision of a physician. The scientists at FDA, NIH, CDC, and BARDA worked together to change that directive to the context of emergency use authorization with guardrails in there so patients 
would be under the close supervision of a physician. Understood. Let me ask you this. It, 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 initially, you appeared to be uh, encouraged by what could possibly be a result of, of the, the effect of hydroxychloroquine. When did that change? When did you sour, if you will, on, on, on the use of hydroxychloroquine? I believe that we've seen many drugs that could have benefit, and some of these are really interesting things we've never heard of, some we have. I understand that, but my question was, when did you sour on it? When it was determined that this drug should be made available to Americans outside the context of a close physician supervision. So I supported conducting a randomized controlled clinical study for hydroxychloroquine at the NIH. When I learned that there is a directive to make it more broadly available, not under close supervision of a physician, I was... When was that? When did, when, when, when did that directive go out? That was uh, March 23rd. March, and that's the time that you decided, no, this is not what we should do, and we should not be looking at hydroxychloroquine at all. I didn't think that was the proper, safe way to evaluate that drug in the context of this outbreak. I believe that should be only done under close supervision of a physician. When we put the EUA in place that locked this drug down to only be used in patients under close supervision of a physician, we were satisfied we had those guardrails in place. When an email string followed a week later saying, ignore the EUA, push this drug into the retail pharmacies, uh, in New York and New Jersey, that's when I became more concerned. And, and who put that directive the out? The time has expired. Who put that directive out? The gentleman's time has expired. You can uh, answer, Dr. Bright. Uh, the, which directive, sir? D that it should be put out to the public without physicians approving it. That directive was an email string that had a number of individuals on it, and I believe it first came from Dr. Jiwar, the Assistant Secretary of Health, it indicated the White House was asking for that drug to be more broadly. So, so was it because the president was encouraged by the use of this drug that you became discouraged by it? And nothing to do with politics, sir. I wanted to make sure that Americans were aware of the risk of this drug. It was only available under very but safe... But it is a drug that is indicated and, 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 and has been used safely in the past. The time by uh, uh, almost one and a half minutes. You can finish your answer, Dr. Bright, and then we're going to move to the next member. The drug had been used safely for malaria for a number of years. We didn't have a database of... But it's being used in the same dosage as it was used for time, malaria. Please, please. And I, I know that um, I'm overly generous with both sides of the aisle, but I think that we need to move on. I mean, two minutes of extra time is two minutes of extra time, and I'm not going to ask that it be shared over here. Uh, the gentleman's time has expired. It's a pleasure to recognize the gentlewoman from Michigan. Ms. Dingle, for her five minutes of questions. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you to both you and Ranking Member Dr. Burgess. There still are not enough tests. So even this week, as we're being told, anybody who wants a test can have a test. Is that true in the United States of America? No. Uh, with pleasure, I recognize the gentlewoman from New Hampshire, Ms. Custer. This today. I want to thank you for your courage, for helping us to do our job to protect the American people. So can I ask you a question? And I know you're not political, and certainly we are all trying not to be political. In fact, I'm very proud in our state that our delegation and our governor are working so well together. But Dr. Bright, does this virus give a damn whether a patient is Republican or Democrat? No, it doesn't. This virus just wants to infect people, and unfortunately, a lot of those people get really sick, and many of them die. Thank you. I'm so grateful, not just for your knowledge, for your humility, and for your service to our country. Thank you, and I yield back. Thank you. Gentlewoman yields back. Uh, minority Reserves. Uh, pleasure to call on the gentlewoman from Illinois, Ms. Kelly, for her five minutes of question. Thank you so much, and thank you for being here and your patience. As chair of the Congressional Black Caucus Health Brain Trust, I'm deeply concerned by the disparities that this pandemic has brought to light due to our nation's history of discriminatory policy leading to differences in health outcomes for people of color. I know it's very, I've had three people in my family with it and I lost my uncle 
um, maybe like 10 days ago now from the virus. So it, it, it does definitely touch everybody. Thank you, and thank you for your patience. Thank you. The gentlewoman yields back uh, minority reserve. All right, then we'll go to uh, the gentlewoman from California, Ms. Barrigan, for her five minutes of questions. Thank you, Madam Chairwoman. Um, Dr. Bright, one striking aspect of your account in your complaint to the Office of Special Counsel is the contrast between the public updates by the President and Secretary Azar on COVID-19 versus the analysis you and other experts were providing behind the scenes. Dr. Bright, what impact do you believe that statements by the administration leaders downplaying the COVID-19 crisis throughout February had on the ability of our public health system to mount an effective response to the COVID-19 virus? I believe Americans need to be told the truth. All of those forewarnings and all those educational opportunities for the American public could have had an impact on further slowing this outbreak and saving more lives. Well, thank you, Dr. Bry. I want to thank you for sharing your perspective with us today. I hope that over the course, I hope that your courage in coming forward helps our country forge a better path than the disastrous course chartered by this administration to date. I yield back. Gentlewoman yields back. Uh, pleasure to recognize the gentlewoman from Delaware, Ms. Lisa Blunt Rochester. Five thank minutes you. for questions. Thank you, Madam Chairwoman. And thank you, Dr. Bright, um, so much for your testimony, but also for your courage here today. It's clear since January of this year um, that there has been a failure on the part of the administration to use the scientific evidence that's been prevented by the nation's top public health officials to take comprehensive and I'll use that word again, comprehensive, appropriate and urgent action to respond to COVID-19. Healthcare experts say that we've wolf we're woefully short of the estimated 30 million tests per week that we need to get America back to work as safely and confidently as possible and to avert or mitigate a second wave of COVID-19, which is one of my biggest concerns. Again, I just wanna thank you so much for the time that you have contributed to our country, but also for your courage to be here uh, right now. Many of us are um, challenged as Democrats and Republicans to make sure that our country is, is safe and healthy. Um, and it really is, um, it really, I, I don't think I've ever in my lifetime seen anything like this. And it does require us to look back and at the same time, look forward and make sure that we have what we need as a country. So I thank you again, and I yield back the balance of my time. The gentle, gentlewoman yields back. It's a pleasure to recognize the gentleman from Illinois, uh, Mr. Rush, for his five minutes of questions. Do you have your microphone on? Yeah, I have one now. Good, now I can uh, hear you. Okay. I want to thank you, Madam Chairman. Now, the right, it's so good to see you. I've been watching you uh, this morning, and it just amazes me about your courage and your insight and your commitment. And I'm just so delighted to be in the same room with you. But I certainly thank you so very much, and thank you for, again, for being here and letting the American people know what really is going on in our nation with this pandemic. I thank you. And Madam Chair, I yield back the balance of my time. Thank you. Gentleman yields back. Uh, there is uh, no request from the, uh, um, you're out of speakers, okay. <laughs> uh, it's a pleasure to uh, recognize uh, the gentleman from Arizona, Mr. O'Halloran, who is a member of the uh, Energy and Commerce Committee. Dr. Bright, thank you for your remarks today, your insight, your knowledge, and your caring for the American people. Madam Chair, I yield. Gentleman uh, yields back. A pleasure to recognize the gentleman from Oklahoma, uh, Mr. Mullen, for his five minutes of questions. 
Thank you, Madam Chair, and I'd be remiss not to thank you for your continued prayers for my son. Uh, it's very kind of you, and I, I really appreciate it. Um, Dr. Bright, you're here on your own time as an individual, is that correct? Yes. Uh, where are you currently employed? I'm currently an employee of the uh, Department of Health and Human Services, and I'm in the middle of a transition, I guess you would say, between BARDA and the NIH. So, so you've, you've accepted the reassigned position to NIH? That except that this position is under discussion at this point. I have not yet accepted that role. So where, are you currently being paid? I'm currently being paid. Where are you being paid from, out of BARDA or from NIH? It's not completely clear to me, but I believe it's out of NIH. So are you getting a paycheck since you've been, you've been over there since mid-April, right? Is that correct? There's only, I've received one paycheck, sir. What, from NIH? I think it was still part BARDA and part NIH. I've had discussions about my onboarding so process are you, NIH. Are you, at BARDA you made 285000 is that correct? That's true. So how much are you currently making at NIH? I don't think my salary has changed. It's still the same? So have you, you've been over there for approximately four weeks a month? It has been about three weeks since I was removed from my office at BARDA. So have you reported to NIH yet? I've checked in with the NIH director's office and mm -hmm. we've discussed the onboarding process, the fingerprinting process, and we had a call just last evening to discuss a framework of my responsibilities that they have envisioned for me at NIH. So you haven't actually reported to work, but you're still getting paid, correct? I've been on sick leave since I was pushed out of my position at BARDA. Sick leave for, for what? For very high blood pressure, and I've been under treatment for my position. For hypertension? A, for hypertension, sir, yes. So you're on medical leave? I've been on medical leave. This week, however, I transitioned from that medical leave to annual leave so I can manage this. I'm what is annual leave? Notice. What do you mean? You're it's vacation time. So, so my, you're on vacation time right now? I'm on vacation time. Did you time inform today. your supervisors about you coming here today, or did you need to do that? I have informed them about my leave status, and I've had a conversation with them last night. So you transferred from medical leave to vacation this week, or does it start next week? I had a conversation with my physician about my hypertension and how we've been managing it over the last three weeks because this has been very stressful to be removed suddenly without explanation from my role and position. It's a life change for me. And my Did physician you're... has been working very closely with me to manage my hypertension mm -hmm. and, and stress. And the conversation I had with him last night indicated I, I that... I guess I'm kind of confused there because you say you have hypertension, but yet you're able to do these interviews, you're able to make the report, and you're able to prepare for this hearing. Yet you, you're too sick to go into work, but you're well enough to come here. While you're still getting paid from the United States government, is that correct? Sir, I've been under medical leave until I get just that, but yesterday. if you've been underneath medical leave, too sick to do that, but yet you can prepare for, for a two-hour hearing. I just, just having a hard time tracking that. I, I, have, I have a hard time understanding that. And if, you, and if you have hypertension and you're too sick to go to NIH, but, yet you're, but you didn't ever experience that in BARDA, right? You never had issues in BARDA with I hypertension? I didn't have the level of stress of being removed from my position while I was in BARDA. So this has been very stressful. Mm -hmm. And my physician. I, get, I know. I, I, I get it. I, people handle and pressure. People handle pressure quite different. That. But as a director of BARDA, I would feel like I'd feel like you're in quite a bit of stressful position when you're trying to manage um, a pandemic. But you can't manage that, or you could manage that, but you can't manage your own hypertension when it comes because you got removed from the office. But yet you can still receive pay from NIH, but you can't show up for work. And then all of a sudden you can prepare for this, but you can't do. That I just have a hard time understanding it. I, 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 I know you're a bright individual um, and very smart, but you are an employee of the federal government. And I just want to make sure you're not doing something to deceive the American people at the same time getting paid from the United States government. With that, I'm going to yield. Seeing no other members uh, to speak, uh, I want to uh, close uh, Dr. Bright. Uh, you've been here for just shy of four hours of, uh, of straight testimony. And uh, my observation is the following. I think that you are the finest ambassador in our country for scientists. Your encyclopedic knowledge, uh, the depth and the breadth of it, I think as the American people have listened this morning that you have given them confidence. You've also issued 
your warning. The United States still has more cases, uh, more deaths by far than any other nation on earth. And by that definition, um, we have, in my view, a profound failure. You have given this committee a roadmap today. Uh, and we all have been um, witnessed your integrity. So thank you for your service to our country. Uh, thank you for your willingness to testify here today. Thank you for your courage, which has raised your blood pressure with all of the, um, what one content, contends with when you become a high profile uh, witness. Uh, but I think you should um, rest assured that you've made a difference today. And on behalf of all of my colleagues, I thank you and salute you. And thank you for your family being here as well. Thank you. Thank you.